Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation and fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in earth and in heaven, and which are on earth, even in him. I'm going to stop there, but we won't get anywhere near that far. In verse 7, in whom, and of course you remember that in this first chapter, it's about Christ, isn't it? In Christ, through Christ. So in him, in whom, which would be Christ, we have redemption. How? Through his blood. Redemption. Does anyone uh, shop with coupons? We all do. Matter of fact, the more the better. There was a community that we lived in that the local grocery store, kind of a mom and pop kind of thing, offered double value on coupons on particular days. So these couponers would go in. If they had a 50 cent coupon, on mustard, and they would buy the 98 cent size mustard and basically get it for free. And we were there one day, and this lady had a, I mean, she had a huge amount of groceries and kept running through. And then they, of course, the receipt is probably, uh, you know, 500 feet long. But anyway, by the time they ran those coupons and doubled them, she ended up paying something like $12 or uh, $11 or $12 for all those with a lot. Okay, now a lot of grocery stores don't do that anymore, do they? But what's that called? That, that's called redeeming, isn't it? All right? They give you a coupon and you take it to the store and the store redeems it, basically buying back the cost of that coupon. So in essence, to redeem means to buy back that which has either taken or repurchased or taken captive, all right, to buy back. I've often used the example of a man that fell on difficult times, so he took some stuff to the pawn shop. And he got what money he could out of what he needed it, and tried, you know, and basically uh, used that money to take care of him. Well, then his uh, fortunes turned and everything got back to normal, so he went back to the pawn shop to redeem the things that he sold to buy them back. That is what redemption is. It is to buy back that which was taken. In theology, the purchase of God's favor by the death and suffering of Christ, the ransom or deliverance from of sinners from the bondage of sin and the penalties of God's violent laid in law by the atonement of Christ. Now you understand, in the Galatian letter, Paul talked about us being on the slave market and how Christ redeemed us. He bought us back. Adam was given dominion over God's physical creation, wasn't he? However, he lost that when he sinned. Then he became the God of this world. All right? Well, then when Jesus died, Jesus redeemed 
back to God that which was his. Okay? That is what redemption is all about. There's a scripture reference in Leviticus 25, 25, which actually mentions that if someone has to give something or sell something, if he wants it back, he's permitted to buy it back. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 8 also mentions this principle. I mentioned a few moments ago that Paul in the Galatian letter, it's Galatians 3 and verse 13, where he talked how we were uh, on the slave market and said we were in bondage to sin and how Christ sets us free. So it's a beautiful principle, isn't it? It's a really a beautiful principle. In the book of Ruth, there is the kinsman redeemer. Okay? The kinsman redeemer, which is the nearest relative. The nearest relative. Um, two things about the kinsman. He can either be the redeemer, and you understand that if a woman, her husband has died, then the kinsman redeemer would take her so that he would have, she would have children, and those children would bear their brother's name, or his brother's name. Okay? That's the kinsman redeemer. There was also the avenger of blood. That also fell to the nearest relative. If a family member was murdered, it was his responsibility to go and exact punishment on the one who committed the crime. Now, if he got to the city of refuge to have his case heard, if it was proven that he it was by, completely by accident, then he could stay there. If, however, he was proven that this was murder, then they would push him out of the city. And what was waiting for him outside the walls of the city? Okay, the avenger of blood, that he would be killed. All right? Uh, someone was uh, coached or was, uh, came outside the city. You have to, you'd rather have to help me remember who this is. Was, was it Joab? Anyway, somebody came outside the city and the avenger of blood body. Okay, so this is the kinsman redeemer principle. That is, the nearest relative would marry the girl and, have, and she would bear children for her deceased husband. Remember Job, Job 19, I know that my Redeemer liveth, was his term that he used. So, this is a beautiful picture of salvation. It is to redeem. There's another word that's used in association with this word, and that is ransom. Ransom. Someone is kidnapped. They say, you, I want X amount of dollars, and you pay the ransom, which, in order to receive the love of God. So there is the ransom. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28. Jesus said to die for a ransom for many. And that's how this principle is set in place. So, first of all, there is the fact of redemption, which we have gone through. And in our text reading, the redemption in whom we have redemption. Okay? What is the detergent for sin? It is blood, isn't it? Through, because of blood. There is also the principle of redeeming the time. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. Has anyone else from time to time in the Lord's work, have you ever suffered from tunnel vision? Well, what 
do I mean? I mean sometimes we're looking this direction because we believe that from here is where the Lord is going to answer our prayers. But we're admonished here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but wise. That word circumspectly means circum, means a circle. Speckly is the word that comes from spectacles. So we are to be looking all around. Okay? The Lord does bless and answer prayer, doesn't it? But it may not be the way we think it should be. I have seen the Lord answer prayers in magnificent and marvelous ways. And many of those times from the most unexpected area. One time there at Naperville, we had a man come that was a contractor and he was working in the mall remodeling one of the stores. And he came up to me and he said that the cabinets, they had a kitchen in the back, and they had the sales cabinets, they're just going to pitch into the dumpster. Would I be interested? Well, you know me, it's free. You understand what I'm saying? If it's free, boy, oh boy. So I borrowed a church member's truck and I made four runs, four loads of cabinets to get them to the church house. And then he came and helped us install it. You see, the Lord answers prayers from the most unexpected ways. This man was only there for a few months as he remodeled that store, and he was going to leave. In fact, he left to go back, I think it was West Virginia, where he's from. So, you know, but during that time, doesn't the Lord send you exactly what you need when you need it? Amen. Okay? So we have to be watching, don't we? We have to be looking around us and looking about us to see what God's going to do. Notice verse 16. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time. When we were lost, when we were unsaved, we did pretty much whatever we wanted to. Am I right? After we were born again, we started reclaiming our time. We started buying back. Instead of doing these things, we decided to do these other things. We were buying back Time, redeeming the time because the days are evil. To be honest with you, sometimes I think we uh, are guilty of taking advantage of our relationship with Christ, not realizing that every day is a gift and every moment is precious and that we have the opportunity to serve the Lord in some form or fashion that particular day we have to buy back the time because the days are evil. We agree the days are evil. <laughs> Things are going bad out there. Let's go to Colossians chapter number four. Just a couple books over. Colossians chapter number four. Again, all to the churches of Colossae advises them, walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Okay. Um, is everyone the one there with me? Okay. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Those who are without, that is, the unsaved, the unchurched, the people who are not uh, part of God's uh, children. Walk in wisdom. And you need wisdom for this wicked world, don't you? Okay? We need wisdom of 
how to respond. Wisdom on how to speak and when to speak and what to say. Alright? Redeeming the time. Watch yourself. Okay? Verse number six. Let your speech be always with grace. Seasoned with salt. That you may know how you ought to answer every man. Well, I'll tell you the most dangerous thing we have on us is our tongue. <laughs> right. <laughs> our tongue. A lot of people engage their mouth long before their brain is operating, and they'll just say whatever crosses their mind. Well, we need to be careful, shouldn't we? Of how we speak, especially out in the world and what we say. I told you about a preacher friend that he's gone on to be with the Lord now. I'd walk into the grocery store and I could hear him clear up front because he'd be singing songs, praising the Lord. Not around the corner, he'd see me, he'd fly up those hands. He'd go, oh, right. okay. okay. I'm sure a lot of people thought he was a nut, but he was easy to find. <laughs> but he was a man that was showing his faith. And we need more of God's people to show their faith, don't we? So there's the fact of redemption. Of God buying back that which was taken. And there is the principle of the progressive redeeming, that is redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Now back here in Ephesians chapter 1, go down to verse number 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Do you, do you remember when earnest money was given? That means a deposit was given. They used to call it earnest money. Okay? All right. Which is the earnest. If you look at the last part of verse 13, the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. What we have now from God is simply the down payment of what will happen. Notice, until the redemption of the purchased possession. What is the purchased possession? That is all of us. Will not our bodies be changed in a moment, a twinkling of an eye? The Spirit of God will be the life of the body. Purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. So, the buying back. Redemption will not be complete until Jesus is king. Let's turn back to Colossians chapter 1. I look to verse number 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood. You notice here in Ephesians 1 and verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Almost exact, isn't it? Okay? Even the forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 1. The forgiveness of sins. Almost exact. From whom, that's Jesus, we have redemption, or we have been redeemed. And what is the cleansing agent? It is his blood. Right? I take you to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. We can say Paul can. Most of Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. So, Hebrews chapter 9. Starting with verse 11. Remember, the book of Hebrews was written to the Hebrew people. 
Paul is using, saying how Christ is superior to the law, to the prophets, to the priests, to the sacrifices. He is superior in all things. And verse number 11, but Christ is come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more, and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of bulls, of goats and calves, but by his own blood entered in, entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He is talking about the tabernacle, how the high priest would take a lamb, he would cut its throat and catch its blood, and he would walk into the most holy place, the holiest of holies, we call it. And in there, he began to walk around the Ark of the Covenant, sprinkling the blood from that uh, lamb without spot of lynch. Then he would come around to the front on that seven turn and stand there. And what would happen? What would happen? What was that? What was that light that came? Shekinah glory, it's called. You won't find that anywhere too much in place. Would come that model and light between those two cherubim. What was underneath those two cherubim? The mercy seat. Where else can a person find mercy from God? Right? Mercy seat. So you have this light shining above on the mercy seat, below the two cherubim. And the high priest had his breastplate and six stones on each shoulder, and the light would shine off of there, signifying God's acceptance of the sacrifice. Notice in verse 12, but by his own blood he entered one entered in once. How many times? Once. Into the most holy place into the whole place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without stop to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now there's an argument for service, isn't it? How much more? Okay. So, eternal redemption for us. Let's go down to verse 15. Same chapter, Hebrews 9, verse 15. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the, trans uh, of the transgressions, that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal, of an eternal inheritance. What makes a testament in force? The death of the testator or the writer. Okay? So you see, Jesus had to die in order that the new testament might come in force. All right. So redemption is the principle of buying back. Jesus redeemed us, took us from the slave market, and made us his own. One more stop. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Starting with verse number 17. 1 Peter 1. And if ye call on the Father, who would not respect a person judging according to every man's work, ask the time you are so journeying in fear, for as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition of, 
from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot, excuse me, a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world and was made manifest in these last days for you. So our redemption was not through earthly means, right? Not by earthly means. Redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. But it was redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Now next time, the Lord willing, we will talk about blood redemption. It is not a pleasant subject. But that is the agent. That is, as one writer said, that is the detergent that God uses to cleanse man from sin. And we will look at that next time the Lord will.